Hey everybody, having a good time so far? Yeah, yeah this it, it's weird. I, I've been here uh, 13 out of the last 15 years. And uh, I'm Randall Schwartz, by the way, uh, just to introduce myself. Um, and, and it's so amazing how much earlier the con seems to keep starting. I mean, for the people who've been coming for a while, I mean, Friday afternoon is looking like Saturday night now. This is insane. This is so cool. I enjoy this. I enjoy this a lot. Uh, so anyway, so uh, my background, my claim to fame is, uh, wait, well, hey, let's do this. How many people here listen to Floss Weekly? Zero. Zero. Okay, that's good. That's good. More people have subscribed to it. I do an open source podcast called Floss Weekly. Uh, I get to interview really cool people every week. 50,000 downloads a week and um, I, I, 10 years. I've been doing this for a long time. Also, maybe uh, a few of you might know me from my Pearl history. Uh, people, anybody here know Pearl? Pearl? There we go. We got a few. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Camel book, llama book, alpaca book. Those are all mine. And uh, also, uh, I, I'm also been coming here for many years, thanks to Scott inviting me for the first time talking about my uh, felony conviction. And I gave a number of talks here uh, over the years uh, that still impacts me, by the way. So there's still places I can't go. I can't go to Canada or Australia. Can you imagine that? I've been to 58 countries, but I can't go to Canada or Australia. I think Australia because they already reached their quota of felons. So I can't go. I can't go there. All right. Anyway, but so, you're safe in Georgia. Yes, <laughs> apparently I'm coming to Georgia. It's fine. Yes, apparently I'm, I'm okay here. So here's the thing: How many people here want a flying car? All right, right, right. Okay, but you know what we have to do before we do that? How many people here want a self-driving car? See, that's required before, and the reason it's required before is because I spent 270 hours in the left seat of a small plane. So I know how to fly. But I don't want you guys out there <laughs> flying through the air. I want that to be automated before you guys get it. I think you understand why. OK, so here's the point. Um, but self-driving cars have their own issues. We're going to talk about two primary issues tonight. One of them is, uh, can we write the right um, uh, laws about, well, what if a self-driving car kills somebody? Who's responsible? The manufacturer? The owner? The guy who is driving most of the time? Who do we, who do we, you know, point the finger at there? So that's one very important issue. The other important issue we're going to talk about tonight is, um, can it be hacked? everything can be hacked. I'll just solve that question right away. But I want the uh, I want to start by having the rest of my panel here, both of you, uh, first introduce yourself and ask and answer which of those two issues are more important and do we need to solve both of them before deploying self-driving cars? To my left. Hi everybody, I'm Ishan. I am a graduate student at Georgia Tech. I work for the Internet Governance Project, which deals with a lot of technology, policy, security, privacy issues. And uh, I actually worked a bit on the current V2V legislation uh, at the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration. So I know some things about connected cars. And the answer to the hacking is pretty straightforward. Everything can be hacked, and <laughs> of course. so can cars. And so, th as they have been in the past, uh, so far for demonstration purposes and not with malicious intent, but you never know. So, um, the issue with you know designing security around self-driving cars is that you don't normally associate cybersecurity and software capability with the National Highway Tr and Transport Administration. So it's trying to bridge these technological challenges in new areas thanks to you know engineers and scientists doing their job well. Uh, I'm Jim Nettles. I have a background in business and technology consulting. Uh, a lot of my background was actually in insurance, liability, product liability, uh, the whole suite of insurance in the back end. And actually going back to the late 1990s, I did some work 
where we were starting to look at the first um, liability insurance policies around the technologies for self-driving cars, some of the first automation and security systems. Uh, and since that time, I've worked heavily in e-commerce. I have worked heavily in a lot of emerging technology fields, data security, disaster recovery, business continuity. Uh, I'm also a science fiction and fantasy author as well as a nonfiction author, so I'd like to take and twist it to see exactly how sick and twisted I can take those things that we do work with and play with on a, on a daily basis. So I get to work with both the reality side and also play with ideas, concepts, what are we looking at in emerging technologies, what does it mean for us. And in terms of the two questions, I, actually one of the biggest things for me is actually the ethos we're going to put behind self-driving technologies. Anything can be hacked. We see it, we know it. If it was built by people, it can be cracked in some way, shape, or form. And we know that legislation, laws, even societal pressures don't keep up with technology as rapidly as we move. And so as we look at questions like the legality of who would be liable in the event of a self-driving car, I also ask the other side of that question. If I own the car, and I put own in quotes because of, of current case law, if I own the car, is the car more liable to protect me or the other, other citizenry, and I, I like to throw that question out there of, you know, the self-driving car is cranking along and a bunch of kids run out in front of me. You know, is the algorithm obligated to protect me or to protect the 12 kids that just ran into the road to become speed bumps? And that's an amazing question, too, actually. Uh, I remember, uh, I think there's a website, MIT, was it, somewhere that has, like, these ethical questions. Yep. Yeah. MIT. Right, right, and it's, it's, it's really amazing to go through that and go, would you run over, you know, the kid and the dog <laughs> versus, you know... The kid, yes, the dog, no. The, okay. <laughs> to, or, rather than caress into the, 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 the blockade, uh, given the... And, and it, it, it's difficult to answer a lot of these questions. And um, one of the things we keep hearing about self-driving vehicles is like, well, if we can get them to be at least better than humans in making these decisions, does that mean we should roll it out? Um, you want to, you want to take? Oh, oh, sorry. We have. Do you have a final final number? Two questions. One is, uh, who are you? And then, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, given the issues around uh, self-driving cars being um, uh, hackable, or self-driving cars being uh, um, uh, what happens when they run over a kid. Uh, which is more important, and do we need to solve both before we deploy? Hello, can you hear me? No. Yep, a little bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I apologize for being late. Um, if I had deployed a self-driving car, I might have been here on time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my greatest argument is if we can make self-driving cars, we should be able to transport, teleport, and so uh, I think we're a little behind in the technology. But in any case, my name is Cara Chapel. I am a FOIA specialist uh, working in the city of Virginia Beach. I am also a personal para, excuse me, let me rephrase this, uh, paralegal specializing in personal injury. So I may be able to answer some questions on where we can go where the injuries actually happen. So again, I apologize for being late. So what do you think? Do you think that you have to solve both of those issues or? just the important one. <laughs> Which would you call the important? Well, the, the two issues were, do we have to deal with the fact that uh, self-driving cars, when you have legislation around who is responsible when it runs somebody over, and versus uh, do we need to make it non-hackable? Uh, as we're already sort of agreeing, that's not possible either. So. I think the, the greatest thing that we're looking at is uh, who's going to have the liability yeah. on this as to whether it is the uh, individual, the company that is running that self-driving car or the personal, the person who is actually not driving that car but must maintain insurance on it and what do those insurance limits look like? So part of the problem here is we're looking at issues like Okay, if I have, a, a, there's like five levels, I don't have them in front of me, sorry, but the five levels of self-driving cars, one of, is like the ultimate, which is Johnny Cab, you know, from uh, Total Recall, right? So that's all the way up at the top end. If that car ran over somebody, 
who would pay? You know, that, and that's an important issue. Uh, anybody have an opinion on that? Well, uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take questions in a few minutes. Just going to get in the tone set here. Uh, no, I am not a lawyer. I Again, I was a personal injury paralegal for about 14 years. Um, so who would pay? Well, I, there's always a battle going on in the legal <laughs> field as to who pays. Uh, that's why there are so many lawsuits all the time, uh, dependent on who ran into who, what was the speed, who did what, and who owned the car. So when we are looking at the issue of self-driving cars, who owns the car, yeah. who actually has to maintain the insurance, and then uh, the hacking capability and where do you insure that how do you insure that well and, that and that brings up a huge issue which is okay suppose I could hack a car to drive into uh, a group of pedestrians you know uh, first off it'd freak out the guys that are in the car <laughs> but but I mean like where is that gonna lead well, the one thing I throw out there is, you know, again, if it can be done, somebody's going to do it at some right, point. Right. Uh, but when you're talking about the, the legalities of it, the insurance, who's, who winds up being liable to start with, you know, a lot of that's going to depend on the level of technology that's currently in the vehicle and the capabilities. So the first question is going to be how much automation is there in that decision making? And the second question is going to be how much of that was the driver using at that point in time? So if I've got fully, let's, get, let's say I've got Johnny Cab, but I'm, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and I'm not sure who I am, if I'm a dream or not, and I rip Johnny out and I take control, I'm going to probably be liable on multiple fronts. But, you know, if I think one of the things that we also see already coming in some of what's being proposed under insurance law is going to be if we have these self-driving cars that are fully automated, uh, especially in larger cities, we're already seeing smart car and these sorts of things happen right. where we may be we may be moving into a time of less personal ownership of these kinds of vehicles and more on demand. So that's going to put the liability then probably on those owners and then pass on to those people that are using it. But I still think it's going to be a blend and a combination of both because I still, one of the things that will have to happen to be fully automated is going to be the intelligence and the sensors pushing along not just for my one vehicle but also everything around me within a significant right. region right. so any accident that happens that involves just the two vehicles is going to be largely driven by how that level of automation is going on at the time and i think one of the things we have to look at is that the fact that uh... we can fly planes ninety percent of the time on autopilot doesn't mean we can fly them 100% of the time on autopilot. Uh, because there are times when you just need somebody to step in and override and go, this is how to take care of this particular emergency situation. And I'm wondering, can we ever get that, even that level of autopilot in cars? Because there are times when, as a human, I'm looking at the road trying to figure out where the heck am I? You know, where, where's the lean, given that we've got snow on the ground? That I think we're going to have to, I don't know if we can program that level. I'm, I'm a programmer, so I trust that we can probably get most of the way. <laughs> but I wonder about that. And uh, anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, well, just to back up a bit, I mean, the autonomous vehicle argument is d new in the sense that we haven't had autonomous vehicles so far. Right. But we've grappled with these sort of issues as technology has progressed over the years. So when the Ford Model T came out first, a lot of people wanted to sue Henry Ford for <laughs> whatever accidents happened because yes. there was no concept of machines on the road. And uh, like three years ago, Toyota had to pay millions of dollars because there was a problem with the Prius where if you actually pressed on the brakes, the car accelerated. Ah, yeah. Um, and this was like a multi-million dollar lawsuit. So, and there is no autonomous vehicle in that framework, but whatever accidents happened in the, because of that bug or whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, Toyota was liable. So I feel like we do have the legal framework to deal with these issues. It's just that 
are the people making the decisions um, as informed about the issues as they should be? I, I think from a legal standpoint, we are going to be looking at something that is going to be created from case law, state by state basis, and at some point maybe federal will look at it, but right now we are looking at case law on a state by state basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're opening it up for questions, so if you want to have a question, just raise your hand and we'll uh, pop the cube over to you. Oh, there it is. Here. So, questions? Questions? Here we go. You in front? Oh, oh, just put that anywhere. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Hi there. Um, so, to all of your points, um, so from what we understand, it's the car interpreting what the sensors are telling it, but in reality, the only way that the car can interpret these things is through the software that's put in the car. And I feel like that adds another layer of complexity, not that I have any you know, professional experience in this stuff. But I mean, as we all know, like frequently with software, like licenses are different. You may own the license, you may own the software, you may not own the license or the software, so where's the liability vested in your ownership and the software? Is it in your license? So I feel like that might be a complex issue that could arise. Well, there, there's actually a case law that started on that, and that had to do with John Deere tractor where there was a question of ownership because of somebody going and wanting to modify the operating software for the tractor. It was an industrial farm tractor. Uh, and ultimately, case law came down and said, no, that's really John Deere's. They said, you can't, you can't modify the software, wow. mm -hmm. which in a lot of ways in case law sort of came down to say, if I put software into a vehicle, I don't have complete ownership. I'm buying a right to use it. Um, and I think that's one of the big keys when we get into the law of it is going to be I'm buying a right to use it, but we've already got established case law for that. I mean, we, we do it all the time. If I rent a car, if I rent anything else, there's still insurance around it. Um, and I think it's going to be, you know, like anything else, we'll see that swing where case law will be going up, up, and up, where they'll in, we'll incentivize people to get self-driving cars that are more efficient, all the rest of this, and at the same time, we'll see premiums for those things go down, and then we'll start to penalize those people who are Luddites and don't want to get into a self-driving car, much like me, um, because I've worked in technology for 30 years and I know it fails. <laughs> yeah. And part of the problem with that, too, is that if the people who are building self-driving cars aren't open sourcing their software, then we can't, outside the company, review it to make sure it's not doing stupid things. You know, it might be that, uh, you know, if you have your code published out there to everybody, then we can look at it and go, oh, you know, on, in, a, in a sandstorm, this thing's going to be horrible. And it would be nice to have some requirement then that, um, you know, some government interference <laughs> that says, you know, uh, by the way, if you're going to have a self-driving car and you're going to put people at risk on the road, it needs to be open source so that people can review it outside of the company. Yeah, so taking like current um, legislation into account, there is a rulemaking procedure for V2V communications, uh, which is going to be in effect in 2020, which means that every car sold after 2020 is, will need to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication capabilities. And the way that rulemaking is designed is that the software is not open source, but there is a 340-page docket which every car manufacturer's software has to comply to. And nobody will get it right. <laughs> <laughs> nobody. And um, because, as I said, it's the National Highway Transportation Security Administration doing software, they had some stupid things like uh, getting people to share PKI keys and stuff like that. Um, which is not a great thing if you don't know much about PKI. But um, so those are the kind of challenges that even if you have the government setting standards and you know benchmarks for manufacturers, getting those right to the extent when this is a life and death matter, literally, yes. is the challenge. And well, another question. Well, if you go back to the Johnny Cab. Okay. If you're using Johnny Cab, it's you're getting transportation as a service. Hold the mic closer, please. And it's it's yeah. kind of clear that the Johnny Cab company is right. providing everything to get Arnold from point A to point B. Yep. So they're responsible. But as you move down the scale 
to the point where I could take control and I turned all of that off, I should obviously be liable if I drive into the nun and the children and the puppies. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be an intermediate point where should I have been allowing the car to drive on its own if it's in a sandstorm and that's in the manual? You know, do you, do you sense any, any, any kind of comment on where that level or where that cutoff might be? Well, and there's actually one more component to that um, because there, is, there are certain drivers behind it that if conditions become what a governing body declares as unsafe, part of the system would be to shut down everyone operating a vehicle in that, in that area and then do automated reroutes. Um, so there's actually been conversation about doing this when you go to that next step of automation and management of the technologies in the vehicles. Um, because again, you can't get to near full automation and full automaton or auto autonomous vehicles until they all are talking, which also means we're looking at a fairly long tail of people that as vehicles phase out 15, 20 years, moving into the tech before everything is speaking. So, but yes, I think it's gonna go down to personal liability. That's what everything is built around today is personal responsibility. Yeah, and um, so right now in California where all these companies are testing their self-driving cars, um, uh, they have to report uh, disengagement rates, which is when the actual human in the car has to take over from the AI or software. And some of these time frames are so sl uh, small that Uber had an accident, which wasn't a major accident, they just scraped on their car, but the disengagement time was 0.2 seconds. So in 0.2 sec, the driver in the car, the human in the car had 0.2 seconds to realize that the car is going to crash and basically turn away or break or something before there was an actual accident. So. I mean, there's probably going to be some a ruling someday in which somebody says that 0.2 seconds is a reasonable or not a reasonable time for a human to respond, but those are how these things might be decided. Was this a recent accident that happened when someone was driving less than three miles per hour and ran into, a, I guess it was a California State Patrol on the motorcycle? Oops. Oh, Oops. Yeah, uh, no, this isn't this one. This was inside San Francisco, and they, I think they just like drove into a truck or something. Okay, so there was a recent one where someone was driving less than three miles per hour, uh, had it on autopilot, and ran into a California State Patrol on a motorcycle. Chips, is Never that correct? Day. Okay, Never so I guess this guy saw it coming, bailed off, and uh, he was okay, the driver of the car was okay, everybody was okay, but a lot of people were really upset. So where do we go from here? And we could also dial it back even from that. Let's, let's not talk about just people running over people or hitting a car. What if, it, what if an autonomous car runs a red light? What do we do? Do they have green, red, yellow we would sensibilities hope. Yeah. We would them, hope. I mean, are they colorblind? Well, so <laughs> they don't even need uh, sensibilities, right? The dream is that the street light will talk to the car mm -hmm. and just say that you need to stop or not. And at that point, if the street light is talking and the car isn't listening, I think it's the car manufacturer. I think you're looking at a lot of, uh, ec excuse me, technological and economical problems from municipality standpoints yeah, when absolutely. you start to uh, well, jump into that avenue. Yeah, and well, they're only doing like if you guys have been down Northside Drive, uh, Northside Drive is now a smart street, which means that there are sensors everywhere and they're uh, logging in every car, every pedestrian that goes through, and uh, they're testing autonomic vehicles on that street now. Wow. All right, cool. Let's, next question, please. So. As you were mentioning with what if a car runs a red light, uh, one of the things that's been really interesting is seeing people deface stop signs and everything, and basically tricking the image recognition software that's written into these cars. One of the things that's kind of cool, that you actually mentioned open sourcing a lot of the software. Do you see some sort of like a cascading effect of if we fix image recognition software to that point, what happens if like we break the CAPTCHA system in the process and now 
we're able to use this piece of AI to read millions of CAPTCHAs and break the whole internet, essentially. <laughs> it's oh. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is. That's true. It already has. I mean, it's if you look, CAPTCHA is already is already fairly easily beaten by a number of. of it's, it's one instance where, like, do you see cascading effects? Of, yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, talking about like fooling, defacing uh, stop signs. Um, some researcher in Germany was able to fool a self driving car sensors by using a $30 laser pointer, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What was it, a cat driving? <laughs> yeah. Because laser pointers are good for cats. All right, question back here. So, um, in, in thinking about this a little, one of the interesting <laughs> uh, side notes to this question, ultimately, is that while we do not have necessarily fully autonomous vehicles at any scale, we have highly assisted vehicles now flooding the streets. You have lane avoidance, you have parking assistance, you have all these things that actually will physically assume control of the car when they decide it's time to do it. You also have, this is largely um, coming in in a big way in fleets now too. So then there's another question of when software updates trigger liability and, and are they behind? Did they do all the regions? Are they the same? But as these things fail or have things that generate litigation, I think one of the next step up questions is how quick is this going to make the race to federal preemption? Because before you even get to the fully autonomous car, if you have 900 different decisions on lane avoidance or backup mirror sensing or whatever that's in these various cars, nobody, whether it's the insurance industry or the consumer or uh, you know, the car companies or anyone is going to want to deal with that. And then of course, we know how good Congress is at making things that work. All right, so <laughs> when you start talking about these sorts of things, when you get into the design, the development, the code, and the legalities of, of all these moving pieces, the first thing I'm going to throw out there, going back to the red lights, is what is the government impetus to actually use better technologies? Because let's say that we do fully automate this. How much revenue are cities going to lose on the red light cameras? All of it. Most oh, of it. All of it. Unless they run the red light. Unless, well. <laughs> okay, so but do we really have to have a discussion on these red light cameras first? Seriously? <laughs> do we really well, need to do this? <laughs> uh, and I, so when we start talking about the money behind this, because when we all fundamentally get down to it, we're talking about two things, business and government. And both of those, the, the same thing ties both of them together is money. So, you know, we're talking in here about liability and all these sorts of greater concepts. It's all about where does the money come from? Where does the money go to? You know, we're, we're talking about what's the greater good here of some of these technologies because all of liability, all of lawsuits, all of this fundamentally gets down to compensating people when damage occurs. Okay, so if we get back to the whole red light concept, and I'm sure I'm going to hear a lot of disagreement in this room. Um, the red light stop cameras, where they issue you a ticket, they send it to you in the mail, they say, this is your ticket, you have it, pay it, otherwise you're in trouble. Um, that is not, to my understanding in this state, legal service of process, correct? That's correct. So you can fight it, you can say, I'm not paying this ticket, not going to do it. The municipality where you live uh, can decide to deal with it in whichever way they deem most appropriate for them. However, as I understand it, it's not legal service or process, which is a governmental. Well, I, I use the red light cameras as an example, but I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the full spectrum of what we have for ordinance enforcement for drivers, whether that's speeding, whether that, you know, that's all the things that ostensibly are done in protection of public service and public safety. Yeah, but they're also revenue generators. Sure. So if we're going to hit this most basic one, let's hit the most basic, which is currently in place. And then we're going to look at the next level of this, which would be the next red light camera for the self-driven cars. And who do they hit? And if they're not giving you legal, legal service or process, who's paying that ticket? Should you? Should the people that manufactured that car? Yeah. Who should yeah. and who will is probably going to be. Well, 
so coming to like the revenue part i think when you have an autonomous vehicle they're going to be well just forget an autonomous vehicle a connected vehicle there are going to be many more streams of revenue making open up with compared to the ones that closes so i know that already car manufacturers are wanting to commercialize v2v communication so basically every time you drive by a starbucks just the screen on the car is going to pop up the starbucks has a discount today why don't you stop here so i'm sure cities already have like congestion charges and stuff like that so i don't think money making is going to be the problem once you have an no i don't think it's going to be a problem but I th it's going to be one of those things that legislators who are not technologically apt are going to look at and ask and consider how they replace money it's already happening. Oh, yeah, I know it's already happening. I've been involved in some of it, but it's always fun to see the guys that aren't. Yeah. Okay, so anyway. you legislators and technologically apt in the same sentence, right? <laughs> <laughs> Again, over here, way... Oh, sorry. Never mind. Let's go ahead and take the next question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, you brought up the John Deere case earlier, and what I was curious about is the tertiary effect of that case, which was... John Deere went after the farmers, and the farmers went out and found some Ukrainian hackers that gave the new firmware and solved their own problem, thus ticking off them. And at the same time, a few farmers learned what BitTorrent was, so that's kind of cool in that respect, too. But the simple fact is, is the technology just went around the law, um, and as has happened so many times, DVD players and regions. Um, so we can talk about federal preemption and, and the need for all that stuff, but in the end of the day, when we talk about something like cars that can kill people, um, what's the futility, I guess, in, in passing more and more and more draconian laws on this when the next piece of firmware that just ticks off Elon Musk comes out of Beijing so <laughs> someone can take their Tesla to 57 miles per hour instead of 55? Well, the first part of that is going to be what we already see today, which is if I violate my EULA, and you're going to have to sign a EULA probably every time you start your car, um, which means you're going to be liable to read it But in case they change the firmware. They do a software update, and they go, by the way, you need to read 8,361 pages before you start your car. Um, but well, if you... What if I'm late for work? Yeah. <laughs> scroll, baby, scroll. Scroll, baby, scroll. But if you violate your EULA, if you hack it, I, I assure you the liability insurance is going to look and go, mm, not covered. By anybody, and oh, sure, yeah. and yeah, that's one of the debates which is probably going to happen is that right, the right to tinker. Then you know, ideally, all these car manufacturers are going to want you to not, never be able to open your hood of your car or ever look inside the engine, because as more and more software takes over the driving process they're going to keep it propriety they're going to keep their licenses so that's definitely going to be one of the ch debates that will shape what kind of cars we have in the future another question hi there um so uh, i think moving back to discussion on determining liability which i guess has been the entire discussion um i guess my thoughts on that uh i mean we've used this before we've used this in the past by determining and differentiating between autonomous use and manual use, uh, there have been cases where they've just pulled the logs from the car. Like, I feel, feel like it, I mean, clearly it's never going to be that simple, but I feel like that would answer many of these questions. Oh, the car was in autonomous mode. Oh, the car was not in autonomous mode. And then, I mean, in their life, the answer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and also that brings the issue up. Uh, I appreciate the question, which is, you know, cars are obviously going to be calculating things. And when we get pulled in uh, to that, you know, first off, can it be evidence in a court case that w this car drove me here? You know, there's probably detailed logs being made all the time. I mean, uh, is that going to be subpoenable? Subpoenable? I don't know what it is, but uh, <laughs> subject to subpoena. <laughs> Able to be subpoenaed. There we go. There we go. Right. So can this evidence, can, can my smart car convict me of a crime? Yeah. Um, 
it's already been used today. There's already data from tracking and GPS and cars today that's been used to convict people of murder. And it'll be even worse when the cars are doing all the driving. Yeah. Um, and there's that case, right? What do you, happens if you use an Uber for a getaway after a bank robbery? <laughs> <laughs> it won't He'll come He'll be on here in it four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it shows up at all. Go ahead, please. Um, to go back to the money and the economic part, um, the company I was with did some work with the Brits who used to keep all of their like local geo data about boundaries and roads and all that was all done at the local level by little local councils. And you to get the data, you had to go and pay them a fee. And, and that was a fundraiser for the, the local government. And they decided, no, let's make that a national thing and give it away. You just log into the government and get the data. People used it to write software to show traffic loading on various highways. And you had an app that would allow you to plan a minimum carbon route, actually, is why they were doing it. Sure. The economic benefit was huge. They got more taxes by accelerating their economy this way. That's going to be the answer. No matter what it is, it's going to be what? the answer that generates basically the most taxes by accelerating. Well, and one of the things out there is going to be, you know, just being taxed by the mile, and you'll be automatically taxed on a monthly basis. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's that law is already, they've already tried to pass that in several states, as well as the, those those movements are already on the books in several countries in Europe. Cool. All right, another question? I've She's got throwing the pew. five people waiting. Five people waiting. Oh. Five or six. Stacking up. Stacking up. We need a self-driving box. So I know... <laughs> Amazon oh. drone to carry it. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I did not mean... <laughs> Cover across. That'd be great. Uh, I know right now a lot of cars being sold have automatic braking. Yep. And I'm guessing almost all of them use radar. I guess two questions. Number one, has there ever been any opposition research where someone like used chaff or a mylar balloon to see if they could fake the car into stopping? And number two, if someone, if I want to kill someone by doing that, you know, wait until they pull in front of a tractor trailer and then use that to stop their car in front of a tractor trailer which can't stop, it would GM hold any liability that it worked on the car and the person died. I believe most of them use LIDAR or just cameras. Okay. So not, not radar, not chaff in the sense the, that we understand that. Might yeah, the early days were the early days they tried to use a limited form of radar um, and found it was easy to game. And I mean opposition research, um, I'm sure a lot of you know about the Jeep Cherokee that was stopped on the highway, so um, those sort of things keep happening because these things are designed by humans and humans aren't perfect in designing things so <laughs> uh, I think and you as you know this research gets more and more developed you're gonna hear more and more about these sort of situations and um, if it's I don't know how much of it's gonna be opposition research if it's opposition research research I'm gonna be happier than said let's say somebody uh, wanting to kill somebody Speak for yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Next question. Discussion of the vehicle to vehicle communication as a way of solving the problems of, of the cars. Basically, created a, a mesh network of trusted nodes. But do I trust every node in the network? The answer is no. This has been studies done recently at Black Hat and DEF CON showing that one in 10,000, one in 100,000 items required to pollute the entire network and, and not be tr trustworthy. So, 10,000 cars on a road, one car is enduring false data, 10,000 cars can crash or just be strange. So how do you solve that problem? We said earlier shutting down the entire highway, there was an easy way, now I can create one intentionally, shut down the entire highway, and I created another problem of 10,000 cars sitting on the highway sitting still, and I can do some sort of terrorist attack. That's There's called no Atlanta. Solution either way. Yeah. <laughs> but but the, 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 the spoofing issue is yeah. important. I mean, if, if we can spoof data, and convince all the cars around me that uh, this we're now traveling at two miles an hour. That'd be a great way to clear out the Atlanta freeway, actually. Yeah. Well, and the, there's actually another study that, that was done that was from the other side of it, which is as we do more, move into more and more autonomy and people pay less and less attention to what they're actually doing operating the vehicles, right. when they're called on upon to actually have to operate it in that, that smaller period, they're losing the skills, they're losing the attention, they're losing the reflex of action. So we actually could be causing a problem there as well. 
Okay, next question. Kind of already touched on it, but it was um, your Fifth Amendment rights and your car testifying against you, your insulin pump, your whatever, you know, your smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, and also just privacy, because your car knows where you went. It can know your political affiliations, um, uh, whether you're having an affair, uh, all sorts of things. And we're moved, our law is not keeping up with this at all. I, I don't even hear it being considered at all. Uh, the police obviously want to convict, on, so they want to use everything. Uh, you know, they want you to be able to swipe your phone, yada, yada, yada. I mean, we really need to step up and think about our rights, both legally and our privacy. What, what was that word you used? <laughs> privacy? You mean yeah. uh, okay, so I, I think the, the first thing that we always have to remember and when stopped is if someone, if a police officer is asking to go through your car is, I'm sorry, officer, thank you. I appreciate your attention and love it, but do you have a warrant? So that's right, but I'm talking about now they suspect that you're the one that robbed the bank or murdered your husband. Now they can go ask my car, did I do it? So the argument here is that you may not even need a warrant to get that data, right? Because Toyota might just send it to the police without or your permission. And uh, so talk. I think this is a bigger uh, question related to IoT in general. And I don't know if you've heard of this story, but uh, Alexa, the Amazon assistant, called the police because of a argument a husband and wife were having, and they, she thought it was a well, she it thought it was a. Uh, you mean Alexa? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a domestic abuse issue. So I think uh, there well to defend the government here, uh, there are privacy regulations for cars currently for whatever software there is right now. Um, I think the problem here is process in the sense is it being followed and is there vigilance around those laws. But I think there's also a potential opening here as well because there are right now today, and correct me if I'm wrong, your vehicle is still considered part of your domicile in essence. It is considered part of your own personal private space. Depending on how we move forward with vehicles and how that changes, how much how much less is that our own private asset, our own private, you know, device, uh, especially if we do move further and further into shared shared hardware, shared vehicles, because as we move more and more of these systems, software, technologies into place, vehicles are going to become much more expensive, a partially because they can, and b partially for the technologies. So we may see where economically we're driven to do this. So do you have privacy rights for the period of time during which you were leasing a vehicle or and leasing the usage of And how of would you guarantee that? You have to log in, key log in somehow? Because if I, if I own the car, it, it, as the company that owns the car, I may say while you're using my vehicle, we will be monitoring you by, you know, by camera. We'll have video feed. We'll have audio feed. We'll have this. We'll have that. We'll have the other. You have no privacy. And I mean, just owning a car might be a whole other uh, thing which we, you know, may not have in the future, right? I mean, if every car is autonomous, why would you have one in your garage? So yeah. we've just made Uber and Lyft a whole lot of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Uh, just uh, I want to follow up on that too, which is that uh, I've often, I've often noted that since I check in everywhere on Foursquare constantly, that I would never be able to commit a crime. Because either I would be putting myself at the scene of the crime, mm -hmm. or I would have no check-in for that period and be completely like, "Why didn't he check in today?" So I, I'm already like committed now. I'm, I'm, I, I, I can never do no wrong now. That's, that's pretty much what I'm saying. Uh, next, please. So I kind of want to preface this with um, the fact with I'm a philosopher. Ethics is kind of my domain. Um, so my question is through the creation of autonomous network cars, assuming we get to this fleet-wide networking, uh, and in recognition of the social, social issue of the expense of the cars, have you not created a class of autonomous car users of a certain socioeconomic status while the rest of us cannot use those cars and are therefore subject to increased kinds of danger given, say, the limitation on uh, software responses to dangerous situations, uh, like 0.2 seconds to break, right? As somebody who teaches motorcycling, we have an exercise where we have to stop at 20 miles an hour. None of us can do it in under a second. So when you do this, you have, how do you address the issue of social safety generated by an entire class of individuals moving around in 
autonomous network vehicles where which ideally cannot communicate with say a motorcycle or a vehicle prior to the deployment of the fleet wide system I'm going to say that's a very good question and I don't know how we do that in a world where social profiling is something that we do not do uh, preferentially well all right so I'm going to be a little evil here um, <laughs> So the, the other side of it is, because I, I, I do have a lot of conversations from an ethos standpoint professionally, you know, what the ethos is of certain business decisions, what the impact is, you know, the greater good to the company, the client, versus the greater good to the consumer, the customer on that side. The short answer is yes, we have a very strong potential of continuing to go down a path where we are continuing to create much greater differentiation in classes by the levels of technology that are available to them. And that is just part of the nature of where we're at, is that we will continue to see people who have access to greater levels of tech are going to have certain advantages. I mean, and I mean, this today is in a lot of ways a great equalizer. I have access to information and data and knowledge that in human history is unparalleled and yet the majority of us use it for cat videos <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with cat videos yeah. what? Well, <laughs> but so you know me on the other hand I'm a data hound I, I plow through volumes of data and knowledge and information and these sorts of things but as a general rule we're also seeing the fact that the greater level of technology we're given the lazier we're getting now throw the rocks. All right, let's go ahead and take the next question. I might kind of go along with uh, a question asked earlier, but, but another thing would be, what if you did, what would be the privacy and legal implications of assuming, you know, the cars would have to be talking to the red light cam, to the red light? The government would al already have the information on where you have been. So what's the privacy and legal, or the fact that they don't even have to get a warrant to know where you are, they already have it going with the municipal counties, most likely monitoring what is going on on the road to make sure that everything, you know, is safe and traffic is flowing, uh, you know, things. So what would be the privacy implication of, say, you did rob a bank and tried to flee, that they could just follow, you know, immediately, you know, go and arrest you just on data without even having to get a warrant because they already would technically have had it. I think generally, and, and this is really totally supposition on my part because this is far outside of what we've thought about so far, um, if you're going to be looking at are they controlling, are they looking at where you're driving, um, then they are, the man is really looking at everything. Uh, it, for automated cars, I think that they would just be, the cars would have some type of communications with the light systems if that's possible and again we're talking about municipalities and level of economy and things like that thrown into it. Um, but in order for someone to start to actually track that, I think they would actually have to be looking for someone and, and it might require, again, the state by state type of contractual or common law type of things, I again, outside. And well, part of the problem that is that it now is so, we have the ability to track so much big data that why not track every single interaction of every single red light camera with every single car? We can do that and we can sort through it quickly. And that kind of data collection, you know, uh, 10 years ago was definitely not possible. And now it's like, yeah, fire it up. Well, and the other thing I, I would throw into that is we already, tr I mean, like I said, we track volumes and volumes and volumes of big data. And if everybody in here had any idea how much data is actually tracked and stored on them. Yeah. But anyway, you know, when you look at data, it's, it's going to be who gets to use it and how. Right. And I'm going to argue that the majority of the time it's not going to be for law enforcement. It's going to be to sell something to you. And, you know, it, going back to, hey, I went by Starbucks, it has a sale. We know you stop here every morning, so I'm just going to go ahead and automatically pull in here. 
Yeah. And um. So. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, you know, how much of our behavior becomes modified by the technologies, the tools we have around us and the things that make it easy. If I have habits and behaviors, our technology is going to learn that. It's going to, you know, we, we may operate in a quote unquote safer world in a lot of ways and we don't really notice how much of our decisions are already governed and driven by what we're being sold to us. One question I have before we start having to wrap up pretty soon here is, again, how good do self-driving cars have to be before we trust them? So right now we have 33,000 car accidents, uh, fatal car accidents uh, on the road each year in the U.S. But I think the threshold for self-driving cars is probably going to be 500. I think like the first person who dies because of, sel of a self-driving car, it push pushes back the effort a couple of years, maybe even five years. Because I think the whole human idea of being in control of what I am driving, like we all know that the roads are more unsafe than say flying or being on a boat or anything, but there is still a bigger fear of flying than driving back home. So I think it's a mindset issue rather than a technology and legislation issue to get everybody on a self-driving car. Cool. Any other comments before? We well, uh, no, oh. I just have another question. I think I'd probably reach out to everyone here. Like, I'd like to climb in my car and go, hey, drive me home. I had two beers too much tonight. Drive me home. <laughs> welcome to Dragon Con. Yeah, welcome to Dragon <laughs> <Yeah>. Con. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and actually, the, the thing I would sort of parallel it to is, yes, we like to have the freedom of driving and operating vehicles. That is something that's been sold and marketed to us. There's a little bit less of that than there used to be, but vehicles represent a certain degree of freedom and things that we can do here. And in a lot of countries around the world where I've been and worked, I mean, we're, it's not as prevalent. But I, I sort of equate it to almost um, vaccines because, yes, certain number of people are going to have adverse reactions to vaccines, there's going to be problems, but there's a greater benefit and a greater good to the society as a whole, and that's the balance is the difference between personal rights and society as a whole as we move forward into these technologies. One of the things I uh, discussed with my friend before I started this panel tonight was even uh, the Hoff would say, hey Kit, I want control. Every once in a while, not very often, mostly he'd just be talking to his wrist and say, Kit, bring, her, bring your car around. Knight Rider, by the way, for anybody who doesn't. It was too young to remember that. Okay, right. But he would occasionally say, give me control. And I kind of like that. I don't think I'd want a car that doesn't have a steering wheel in my future. So we'll see. Anyway, we got a question back there. Um, yes, matter of fact, just, well, two quick things. One, Hoff told Kit one time, I'm not getting a ticket because of your driving. <laughs> but uh, the other thing that's going to have to be meshed into all this is mechanical failures. I mean, those of those of us that's had blowouts on the interstate knows it can be exciting. <laughs> um, the, uh, In a nice and way. you have you know brake failures, um, any kind of other mechanical failure, U joints or what have you. Um, tire blowouts are yeah, always yeah. a fun right, one. Tire blowouts. That's what I was talking about. Um, are the cars automated cars going to say, "Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to start because you've reached a maintenance interval." Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying earlier with flying autopilots. It's like the, the, the fact that the plane can mostly fly itself, except when it can't. And that's the issue. That's why there's human beings in every single plane that takes off today, well, because we uh, have to deal with that. No, no, no. I think with planes, we're looking at a whole different thing. We're looking at IVR versus VFR, and that's, that's so very different from where we are right now. I don't know that it's that different. Well, no pedestrians were <laughs> well, no, flying. But, right? Yeah, but except the planes can hit each other. That's a bad thing. And they hit the ground at the wrong end. Sorry for it's your opinion. See, anybody asked? Answers? I think Cara sort of already answered my question or brought it up possibly, okay. but my thought is the actual stipulations of driving the rules of the road as okay. far as we use Uber and stuff for convenience. We don't want to drive or we're not able to drive, so they come and pick us up and drive us home. But with automated cars, our cars can do that itself. But if we're still at a level where, if at some point we have to take control, do we, 
you know, Uber, do we still keep Uber around because somebody can still actually drive and take control? Or do we trust our automated cars enough to get us home if we've had two beers too many and it automatically says, oh, you need to k take control, I've lost control, and you're going, I can't see the road right now. That's a very important so, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I unfortunately don't know the answer to that. Uh, the last thing that I've seen written on that was uh, something to the effect that if you were driving below three miles per hour uh, as the operator, you were required to take over. If I recall that correctly, something I've read in the last 24 hours. Um, so it, it, that makes it very difficult because even if you are driving three miles an hour and below as an operator, if you've had that two beers too many, you're still subject to that DUI. So I, again, I think it's going to be a state by state and case law created type of situation because this is so new. And, and the other thing I'll, I'd add to that is we've already seen some some essences of case law that still say even if you if if you are the responsible party you have to be in the legal condition for that responsibility so we got about two minutes left uh, please summarize whatever you want to say What's your last statement um, You're up. <laughs> uh, well I apologize for being late again um, I think that self-automated cars or automated cars self-driven at a certain point would be a wonderful idea. I think that we do not have a handle on it from a government or state standpoint yet. It is up for questions and anything that anyone wants to do to drive that to your legislators and perhaps ask those questions would be great. Um, I, the only thing I'd probably add is that we know it's coming and much like most you know really divergent technologies we don't catch up with them as a society until they're here we don't know what to do with them until we've actually played with those technologies we have a very difficult time playing with a blank page and so we're going to have to experience the problems the foibles the trials the tribulations of it until we know how to react with it and I, I think that's really where we're at and that's part of the point of these kinds of conversations we can't answer the question here the conversation and starting it now while we know it's coming I think is the more important part mm -hmm. and yeah just to add to that I think the the way to look at self-driving cars is as a safety issue and the car industry has faced these sort of changes from a safety perspective if you've ever read about the seat belt and airbag challenges who uh, you know they didn't want them in cars and now it's such a given that every car has a seat belt and has an airbag it's almost impossible to think of one without so I think it will be that cup those couple of decades when we have a transition it's probably gonna be a generational gap with you know me and my gray hair telling people that we I used to drive a car <laughs> you know, I mean with my hands and feet uh, I'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not a self-driving car that hit you. <laughs> and I think all I can add to that is that just I think it's important that we have transparency around this. That if the car has limitations, that needs to be disclosed. And that needs to, you know, ideally it would be all, because I'm a proponent for this, open source software, so that we can discover the areas that might be of issue, places where the software might be confused. Uh, we also have to, unfortunately, uh, act as technologists to inform our legislatures, legislators better, because I think there's going to be some bad laws that are going to be written about this. I know this personally. Um, there are going to be some bad laws written about this stuff before we get through the tunnel, literally, <laughs> uh, to the other side. So uh, I thank you all for attending, and have a great rest of the con. Thank you. Thank you.